Welcome to another episode of The Outsender, which is sitting indoors this time once again then. And uh, well, the reason for that is that I want to do and I want to expand on a Swedish episode that I did a couple of weeks ago that I promised to make an English version out of or uh, make an English version of and uh, that uh, that video was called tactical radio communication under the threat of electronic warfare and it had uh, a recommendation to view, which was this uh, interview by Josh from Ham Radio Crash Course with uh, ex Special Forces Sergeant Major Mike Glover about uh, explaining tactical communications with uh, Mike Glover. That's what uh, Josh's uh, video is called. So I recommend that you watch that one. That's basically what the video was all about. But I wanted to put all of these uh, things, these things, into an electronic warfare perspective. So that was also part of this uh, this video. I'm thinking that, well, you can see here, there are a lot of tabs here. I'm going to put all the links in the description below so that you can, uh, well, watch all of this, all the uh, all of these YouTube clips, basically, and all of the articles. And I'm going to make this video into two parts, where the first part will be about the tactical or military type of radio communication and how it works and in the first part now I will end with a presentation of how basically a tactical communication plan could look like or basically how this uh, what the US uh, calls PACE which is primary alternative contingency and emergency communication then. In the second part I will dive more into the electronic warfare component of uh, of this uh, this episode then so you will have uh, a much better understanding when you watch the second episode about the electronic warfare threat in that perspective and what it's all about and i also want to do some some disclaimer or something because it it uh, well you can see here it's uh, uh, russian and uh, russia uh, russians uh, you know more russians and uh, that the US is losing invisible fight to Russia's dominant capabilities and stuff like that. And it's, uh, you know, we have a lot of this, uh, how should you call it, the Russian scare basically going on. And uh, I don't want to be a part of that or contribute to that at all. So uh, the main reason for why I am interested in, in the Russian capabilities is, is not just because it's Russia, it's because they are the only ones today in the world that has these land mobile jamming and geolocation uh, type of electronic warfare systems going on today. They are also the only ones who have, well, I don't think any other army has that in the world. They have incorporated or in integrated an electronic warfare component in a battalion. I believe they have incorporated in a battalion. There's a link here that uh, I am uh, linking to also that basically, where is it? Here. Uh, it's uh, Russia's electronic warfare capabilities to 2025. So it's uh, Roger McDermott who examines this basically, and I, he's got a pretty good approach, where it's not, it's not uh, all about the aggressiveness of Russia, but it also has, uh, you know, he uh, he he's got a more structured approach, I believe, to the uh, the Russian strategy basically, which is. Uh, Basically, that the the Sapad exercises that we are very close to here in Sweden, the the Western type of exercises that they, they maybe not uh, you know always be they appear to be pretty aggressive while in fact they could be strategically defensive, which is another thing then. So when we uh, in the in the army then when we discuss this, it's not really we don't discuss it from fear perspective or panicking or whatever that everything is hopeless and whatever it's that's not how it works so but the public can have that uh, that kind of view and that's not a view that uh, I want to you know uh, contribute to basically so uh, what we usually do is that we see that oh cool this is a this is this is a new type of uh, component here or a new type of threat possibly and how do we counter it basically and how does it work and also from my pers perspective, these uh, systems, they are, they are pretty cool. That's the whole thing. It's land mobile. It's focusing on, 
on uh, land mobile communication about geolocating, jamming and everything. So it's putting the the actual radio communication on land into perspective. While in the West we are pretty dominant, I believe, or we are probably the most dominant in, in the West and the US obviously then, especially in electronic warfare regarding uh, the airspace, you know, regarding uh, fighter jets and air to ground uh, missile systems, air defense missile systems, and everything like that, you know, high frequency radars basically. And there's even, you know, it's not only electronic warfare, there's electronic countermeasures, there's electronic counter countermeasures to be able to counter the countermeasures. So there's, there's a whole thing built up. But on land, uh, basically, no one in the West has this capability, especially not uh, as integrated as the Russian armed forces have. And that's basically what I think is so pretty cool. So it also puts uh, competence of a radio operator into perspective, which may not have always been the case. And I will take some examples here also then. That's also what Mike Lover is trying to, uh, trying to instill or trying to expand on is that he wants everyone to uh, to learn about radio communication because it's very important, obviously. So that's uh, that's also what Josh is focusing on here to be able to put this this type of experience into an amateur radio perspective from a pre preparedness perspective, you know, emergency communication perspective and disaster communication perspective, obviously then. So I'm going, just going to start this video from the start, the Swedish one, and basically do a reaction video of my own thing. And it starts with a very old Swedish uh, video, then I'm going to do this in full screen, I think. So here it says unnecessary signaling. So it's basically, it's an example from an old video that the Swedish Armed Forces did in the 80s or late 70s somewhere, early 80s possibly then, about uh, how to, th you know, deal with the electronic warfare threat. So I'm just going to continue to play this. Uh, this is a movie that it's from, I can see from his caller here that his rank is a captain. This is a captain. I can't see his caller there, so I don't know which rank he has. This is super old, the older uniform, so it's not the uniform we have now. So, this is a subordinate commander, whatever it's called, the <laughs> vice commander. No, I don't know what it's called in English. Yeah, if you haven't noticed, then I. Uh, I'm an, a part-time radio operator in the Swedish Armed Forces, so uh, I'm in the infantry, so that means that I am in a tent in the forest using a radio, and I'm just there part-time basically, so I'm not a reservist, so uh, I'm actually, uh, we do these exercises uh, several times a year basically, so that's my role, and I'm also an amateur radio operator, you already know that basically. So this uh, commander is pretty anxious. He's uh, he's given orders about something that will happen some some time, but his way of hurrying up and waiting it's uh, he gets pretty anxious here. And the no, captain is pretty annoyed. And he, he's thinking that he's going to have some some uh, some form of uh, sign of life, or get some notification from the, the the units in the field about what they're doing. So it's basically like the uh, the telephone era, where you have the instant the generation of instant messaging. But in this case, it's, uh, it's this commander in there. Men eh, jag tror att jag ropar upp dem nu och frågar för att jag måste ha... Eh, vad är det för ett nät som går där? Ja, det är den, ja. Men... Så ja, han är anxious. Och han decides to uh, call the, uh, the units. Och från en artistisk perspektiv, även om det var produkt för the defense. 
there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense, like the uh, the radio they are using doesn't make sense for this level, so there will be more stuff. And here, uh, to the right here, you have a... Uh, it's a... There are several antennas or se several radio receivers that each have an antenna, and this is a directional direction finding receiver. So it will get the direction regarding uh, because the signal doesn't uh, hit the antennas at the same time. So we will have a, a phase, a dif differing phase, and using the different differing phase to the different antennas you can get a bearing, so it, you only get the direction. But you would obviously use not only one of these, you would use uh, at least one other station. And since they know exactly on the map where they are, you can just uh, draw a couple of lines uh, on a map uh, alla, alla Victor, alla and where Victor. you get the crossing using this system. Then you can get the where, where the intersection is on the map then. There you have the uh, the transmitter. And this is pretty fast. It's super fast. It's a pretty fast system to be able to ge geolocate this way if you get the direct wave. You can only be um, very precise in your geolocation if you get, get hold of the direct wave. And in this case it would be that they use VHF or line of sight system and the enemy is pretty close by to be able to receive this uh, direct wave. Or you use uh, ridiculously high antennas uh, mounted on, uh, on poles, obviously, uh, and you know you cover too long of a distance. So this doesn't really make, uh, make sense. Here we have a radio operator in the field, basically like a platoon radio operator. And it doesn't look like this is a platoon. Now I know what it is. Uh, we'll take that. Another one. Radio Call. operator in the field. Uh, I hear something way off. You have a civilian. It's, you know, not a uniform and with a telephone. You could uh, connect this system back then too, I think. You could uh, at least connect the, the later system to the telephone network. And obviously they are direction finding the telephone. Well, they would not. They would direction find where they uh, they connect the link radio to this telephone system. Is it could be n nearby, obviously, but yeah, Better. you don't direction find a wired system. Here we also have a civilian. It looks like with a telephone. No, probably not. And. Now they have a structure, they figured out where it is. So here we have battalions. So this is a symbol for a battalion. So these are all battalions, and then this is a brigade. The cross here is a brigade. I hope it is. I hope I remember the symbols here. I'm supposed to know the symbols. But I think this is a brigade then. So we have a brigade commander. So this guy is a brigade commander who is super anxious and. Uh, he, he's got to know exactly where everyone is at all times. And he's also... You know, it takes a long time. He's uh, transmitting for a very long time, which you obviously don't want to do if someone tries to geolocate you. And now he's uh, also mentioning he's not only uh, doing unnecessary signaling, revealing where everyone is, he's also revealing a lot of sensitive information. We use uh, basically use like a uh, time differential time where we we can talk about the time, but it's not the correct time. You only know that it's a delta from a set time. But he actually mentions the delta time, the the kilo time, as it's called here. So the kilo time could be something, and he mentions what it is. Then you can mention the kilo time plus forty five or kilo forty five, which would be forty five minutes. Uh, after the kilo time, but you don't know what the kilo time is. So the enemy could obviously be there with stopwatches and figure out what the kilo time, but by the time they figured out what the kilo time is, then it's all over. So that way you could talk about uh, different times when things are going to happen without revealing when they're going to happen, which is uh, a way to cover this information. But he reveals what the kilo time is. He also reveals uncovered positions in the train where they are going to advance and stuff like that. So he does everything totally, totally screws up here, basically. 
So what this is an example of is something called mission command. Essentially, and uh, mission command was known back then also, but I don't think we had fully we had implemented it in Swedish Armed Forces at least not in this time. This was more the conscript uh, where we were pretty. The conscript there was uh, in its peak back uh, back then, so mission command was probably not that high on the agenda. But this is a very good example of mission command. We have a, a brigade commander who is anxious and wants to. You know, instantly get hold of uh, his subordinates and uh, you know get uh, make sure everyone knows what they are doing when and uh, you know please keep in touch <laughs> stuff like that. So mission command is basically a leadership philosophy where you basically empower your subordinates. You empower not only the commanders but also the soldiers in in the final uh, destination and final end then to be able to uh, take a task and perform it, perform it according to you know their competence and to solve the task in their way because they know what they are doing better than anyone else that's what they're trained for and what i like about the uh, the mission command thing uh, we have this also in the swedish armed forces mission command is a us uh, us army concept it's called uh, mission commander. I think it's called mission tactics, possibly in other uh, forces, maybe in the British Army. And here it's called, uh, it's the direct translation of the German word, which is Auftragstaktik, which is basically what it is. It's uh, mission tactics. So uh, that's what it's called in Swedish. Then. And we're supposed to have mission tact uh, command in the Swedish Armed Forces and also. But the US Army has this uh, mission command uh, doctrine, ADP 6-0. And this is also in the, you can find this in the description, the links to this. I'm not competent enough to write competence. But what I really like about mission command is that the first principle in this US uh, publication is competence. So there are seven principles of mission command. One of them is con competence, which is why I'm focusing on that you should know what you're doing. That's always a good thing. The second principle is uh, mutual trust. You have to, you know, you have to trust that someone has the competence. If you know that someone doesn't have the competence, you don't trust them, obviously. So that goes hand in hand. You have to have a shared understanding of uh, where and what and why we're doing stuff. And it's also about the commander's intent. So each uh, subordinate commander and each soldier in turn, they are going to basically operate according to the, the higher commander's intent. So it's you don't really have to have very precise directive orders. You don't have, have to have directive command. You don't have to micromanagement every, everything since the soldiers will know what to do according to the commander's intent. That's the whole principle then. And in order to do the, the have the commander's intent, you issue mission orders and not specific, detailed, super detailed orders, where basically it's all just tasks to do. And well, since uh, that's not the case in war, then uh, you have to have soldiers that obviously in, in accordance with the mission, uh, orders and in accordance to commander's intent, you have to have uh, soldiers that can take disciplined initiative, you know, to take the initiative always. And uh, yeah, in, in that uh, sense, you also have to have risk acceptance of higher command. So the higher commands, they give you the trust, they trust you to perform a task in, uh, in the best way you know how. And then they also have to have to accept the risk in that setting because if if the individual soldiers are going to have uh, take the initiative and also take the full risk full risk of failing that task then uh, you will have soldiers that don't really dare you know who dares wins basically so if you don't risk uh, enough you will not gain enough either so that's basically the whole concept so i really like these seven principles they are super good and we don't have this in the swedish publication it's usually more like maybe sort of more like a German, uh, the German uh, 
type of uh, original documents, original uh, writings, which is more, uh, they are more uh, descriptive and not, not very precise, thought out in very short uh, sentences like this. So that's why I really like that. And I really like that competence is uh, number one. As uh, you will know then, in, uh, in war, they usually say that no plan survives contact with the enemy. And that's why we have mission command. If we continue here then, I have a short clip here about lone survivor. And we get back to, I'm going to return to uh, Mike Lover. He's a former Special Forces uh, Sergeant Major. And uh, then obviously this guy uh, and his team, they actually got the same mission as, uh, as Marco Luttrell and his team got and finally became the movie then Lone Survivor and the book also Lone Survivor. So this is just a short clip. It's two minutes. I'm thinking that we're going to watch that also. So here we have a Raytheon. Mike Bravo, Mike Mike Romeo. I have or Mike 8, Mike Mike Romeo. I have no idea what this is. Satellite is not my thing. Comsec key too. So it's a secure channel. It sounds like the voice procedure is correct in this one. So the voice procedure here is, uh, I think it's super correct. I have, I don't really know NATO voice procedure, but um, uh, I know some of it and it's, it sounds like it's uh, really correct actually. Uh, intermittent comms and you would say good copy is the same thing as saying Roger. You would never say uh, you would never say uh, please copy or something. You would never say how copy. That's not a thing to say, but you hear it in amateur radio all the time. But copy is the same as Roger, actually. So it means that you have copied the message. So a good copy. Well, I don't think you would say good copy, actually. I don't think that is probably a proper radio procedure, but good copy would obviously be the same thing. It would be the same thing as Roger or copy that you have received the, uh, the message. So, uh, you know, it's going to... Uh, he picks up a, a satellite phone, an, an Iridium satellite phone here, and uh, the radio guy says, uh, talk to the mountains. And that's why the reason why the satellite doesn't work here, because the mountains are in the way of uh, the satellite. So he pauses this one here, and it, the, this clip here it goes a little bit slower. It says Iridium there, which is nice. I have not used this one, I think. I've used a similar one. I think I've used an older one than this one. But I used Iridium just, I think, just one year or something before they uh, they had to. They were out of money actually, so they turned it down. But actually, had to uh, had got to use it just before they uh, they uh, turned off the system for a short while. I don't know how long you turned it off, but. Pretty annoying then. So this uh, system is the same as the... It doesn't use the same satellites, obviously. The Iridium uh, constellation is, uh, have their own satellites. And the US Army probably have another set of satellites, a constellation. That is not the Iridium satellites, obviously. But both of the systems are something which is called low Earth orbit. So it's a LEO system. Which means that they are traveling, they are always traveling around the globe in a constellation. But but it is it's Afghanistan, you know. It's just Afghanistan. It's uh, super mountainous. They are in a pretty mountainous terrain, and they use uh, when we're talking about pace here, primary alternative, uh, contingency, and emergency. Here they use a contingency. Uh, the alternative was probably the uh, the sat phone, or the that was maybe the primary or something. Or the alternative, I don't know. The satcom was the alternative, possibly, and then the satellite telephone was the contingency. But the, the both both of the alternative and the contingency uses the same carrier satellite in a super mountainous terrain, and they don't have HF. So that did not go very well then, and I think the main issue there was that uh, they were in highly mountainous terrain. Obviously, this is a movie, so uh, you know there's probably some artistic freedom here. And the analysis of why the comms didn't work, it could be uh, it could have been many reasons, but still, they used uh, satcom as an alternate uh, communication means, and the contingency um, means of communication was uh, 
also satellite. It was just satellite telephone. So that, uh, well, then that's not very redundant. Oh, it's redundant, but it is the same carrier. They would probably have an emergency communication system, which I would suspect is like a TAC B, a tactical beacon or something. Possibly, I'm not so sure what they actually had on this mission. So that's the thing then. But I would assume that if you would really have a pace concept, you would make sure that they are redundant and independent from each other. So the long haul communication would be satellite and HF. So maybe they could not bring everything in that scenario. I don't know. I have no idea. Another one that we're going to look at is uh, Bravo 20. You probably recognize this one. The British Special Forces SAS in uh, in Operation Desert Storm way back. So this was in Iraq before Operation Iraqi Freedom then obviously. And well, I'm not really going to go into the details. This is a documentary which uh, uh, doesn't portray what happened obviously. And there's a lot of controversy today, or just a few years after this. I actually didn't know this controversy. I don't think I, I don't remember that I've read the book, but I've watched the movie several times, uh, you know, when I was a lot younger than I am now. And I watched the movie, and uh, yeah, I, I found it, uh, how should I say? Uh, there were a lot of stuff that didn't make any sense because I had a lot of experience hiking experience and a lot of other stuff, survival experience and everything. And it just seemed very unrealistic. I think at the time when I watched this one, I had uh, actually hiked over Iceland also with uh, 34 kilos in my backpack. And I basically had like 39 kilos total. And uh, well, that worked. But then thinking that you would have more than twice that weight, three times that weight, and hike 20 kilometers in just one night. Well, you know, I'm not a special forces guy, obviously, <laughs> and never been, but I w was pretty good shape th back then. So hiking in uh, in Iceland, which is a pretty sandy environment, and I've also been in I've been in Saudi Arabia, so uh, I know the <laughs> I know the the climate and uh, what you're facing. I also understand that uh, you know they, they some of them two or three of them two of them actually died from hypothermia in this operation. But if you want to have the other side of this story, which is not mentioned in Andy McNabb or Mitchell's book, uh, you can watch this video and it's also in the description then to get some perspective of this. And from from my point of view, this makes a lot more sense, especially today when I have some military experience background, basically. But anyway, the the thing in this video, it, uh, it makes sense. So what they actually had in Bravo 20, they actually had an HF radio with them. The area was clear. So it's they I don't know what they are doing here. It's not a very good observation post, obviously. You know, just uh, showing your head every now and then. Andy needed to contact SAS headquarters. Basically, use some digital thing. They had um, a burst, uh, short burst uh, type of radio, a digital type of radio, but they had some serious communication problems. Legs sent the message via short burst radio. So it, it doesn't really make any sense, you know, he just says it doesn't work, Not nothing of the procedures to check the radio, what doesn't work, is shown in this documentary, well, it's artistic, obviously, so uh, there you go, and uh, actually in, in real life, uh, they have reported that they actually received all the messages, they just didn't receive a reply or a confirmation. So it's one-way communication, obviously, which I find is really... Well, they, what they mentioned about this operation was that it was pretty screwed up from the beginning, from everything from command, how it was planned and how it was executed. And that they didn't hike 20 kilometers, they actually only hiked two kilometers. So they had they landed the helicopter pretty much right near where they were going to operate, which uh, 
doesn't really make a good sense when you're in, in a desert. And I've been in two deserts, so I know how far you can see people. Uh, it's just ridiculous. So, yeah, but it's... Um, the radio wasn't working. In the rush to deploy, it had been encrypted with the wrong frequencies. In the rush to deploy, it had been encrypted with the wrong frequencies. It, it's probably not encrypted with the wrong frequency, it's probably encrypted with the wrong key, but in this case actually could receive it. So it wasn't the wrong key. So uh, they were on the wrong frequencies and that doesn't make any sense. You make a radio check before you actually deploy. And or not, if you actually land with a helicopter, you would check your radio again if you are... Yeah, if uh, you do the procedure correct, just to make sure that you have comms from your, you know, final rally point, basically. Unless you have to go in radio silence, but I don't think that this would apply to them. They don't didn't have an electronic warfare threat from the Iraqi army. We'll do an exchange, all right? Andy was unconcerned. The team had planned for contingencies. Yeah, they had planned for contingencies, but for some reason the contingency, uh, you know, the TACB, the tactical beacon ra radio didn't work either. But they received, uh, actually a US fighter pilot actually received their their beacon, but they weren't able to use it to communicate with it. So I don't know really what went on there. Uh, so, But you can watch this documentary, it has shed some light about, uh, you know, the the real story. So I'll finish this episode with this uh, drawing to my left here and explain some of the systems and where they fit in this tactical radio communication system or thing then that uh, Michael Arroso is talking about and uh, how this would look like in a broader perspective and basically where each individual component in, in the different systems are. So this does not only apply to uh, military radio communication, it also applies to emergency communication because you would basically, you would always have a patrol or people on the ground that are out in, in the field and actually report what they are doing, what they are seeing, and they report back to a command post in this case or uh, to a base or something. And uh, that base would collect the reports and report those further up to maybe a regional command or a regional base, basically, and yeah, upwards and onwards, basically, then. So we'll start with uh, this one here. I don't know what the NATO terminology is for, for these uh, command posts and stuff like that. So unfortunately, you know, Sweden is not a member of NATO. So uh, maybe then I would actually know more about that. But since uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm a Swedish army radio operator, so that doesn't really... We do this in Swedish, and I'm not familiar with the uh, NATO terminology fully anyway. I think it's called a forward operating, uh, a forward command post in this case. And uh, that I've also written here that it's mobile, so it's usually a truck with radios in it and antennas on the roof. And it's also that you have portable antennas that you can deploy with uh, masts and stuff like that, poles for VHF then, and also uh, HF antennas that you can just you know, deploy portably in trees and whatever. I have written that it's portable because it's uh, it's highly portable, this uh, thing then. But you sit in the in the truck, in the warm truck, and uh, operate radio, take, uh, take, receive the reports from the patrols then. I've also written that it, this can be a rally point. It doesn't have to be a truck or anything. It can just be a position in the train where you have you know, dumped all your stuff. It's a secure position in the train where you, you're under cover and uh, the opposing force cannot see, it cannot, uh, you, you know, you're covered basically in a secure position. So the rally point would be where the patrols return to with the intelligence and then you would also have a radio here and you would have your packs and possibly also sleeping systems or whatever. And you would eat your food here, stuff like that, possibly then. And I've expanded this one with, uh, with an OP here, observation post. And I've also written that this observation post up here, they could be several kilometers, at least you know two kilometers away, but it can be connected with a wire 
which uh, you know wired communication not via radio so that's the possibility also and this wire could obviously you be used with a transceiver here to remote a transceiver in the at the rally point so you're not transmitting from the op but you're tr actually transmitting from a point much further away so the the danger of having a wire if you've seen the movie 1917 you know what the danger of having wired communications are because someone could find it and cut it and also regarding geolocation if someone if there's a special forces uh, reconnaissance element here in the train that actually discovers this wire you would obviously not only you know disclose the op you would also disclose the command post which is a pretty bad idea then so uh, wired communication is not necessarily the most secure communication either since uh, if someone discovers a wire you're pretty toast so maybe then radio could be an option here but i've expanded this one with the patrols the individual patrols here and these patrols um, you, they are in groups and the soldiers in these groups obviously have uh, a personal role radio. I think that's a British term. We call it internal group radio here, so that they can talk to each other from you know a few hundred meters away, 200 meters maximum possibly in terrain then, but they can still talk to each other. And the patrols individually, they can communicate within the platoon then basically through another uh, radio system which usually only one of them in the groups have. And further up then, the, the platoon commander has a radio operator and the radio operator has a man pack radio, which is usually a VHF radio, a low part of VHF to uh, communicate further up to the forward command post here or the rally point. So we'd use basically VHF and UHF in this setting. Maybe not to here then, you could use wire or HF here, obviously, uh, for many different reasons, not only to not reveal where the wire actually is, but actually uh, prevent uh, the VHF, since VHF is much easier to geolocate than HF. So then I have made a line here and that line is pretty important from my perspective and that's the electronic warfare line. You should not, you know, you don't want to reveal where your permanent command post is uh, situated. This is a mobile command post so you can just, if you have, if you've operated here for a while and you feel that I've been, been operating the radio for a real long time, let's break and uh, regroup somewhere else just in case the enemy is uh, geolocating us so this is a mobile uh, command post that means you can you can move it away from an electronic warfare threat basically but this command post is not that easy to move so that's why i have made this line here and it's my understanding that you do not or it's my uh, that's, this is what I believe, that you do not want to reveal the position of your command post, your primary higher command post. And to do that, you don't use VHF to communicate with that command post. You only use, you could possibly use satellite, but in this case, we want to use HF, short wave. And this system here can also be a man pack. Uh, at the command post here, it's usually a base station. It could be a man pack with a power supply unit that you can power it more easily than you can do with the batteries then, uh, since that's obviously much easier. You, know, you could do more high power than... It could be the same thing here. If it's a truck, it's uh, vehicle mounted, so you, you get the, the 24 volts from the truck then obviously and can use uh, higher power there but since this is hf you avoid a lot of the dangers uh, the risks of using line of sight type of communication which is uh, vhf based and that's what i mean with low probability of detection or what i called low tech lpd and that's basically just using as uh, hf and then especially the Senate concept because that hides the signature even more. 
So from that, this perspective, this is what uh, we will continue discussing in part two of this episode, where this electronic warfare thing enters the picture and why this type of concept is important and why it will be super important if this is a forward command post and you're exposed way out there and someone uh, you know takes out your higher command post and this uh, type of communication you know you're basically only line of uh, your lifeline is broken basically there so you're all exposed into nowhere then. so it's a responsibility for whoever plans this type of communication that the forward command post and this patrol here does not expose the uh, position of the command post by using you know a means of communication that is more easily to, easy to geolocate and where you get a much more precise location than you can with hf for example then which is why i recommend this type of uh, setup obviously so yeah well okay so that's it for this episode of uh, the outsender and uh, the next episode will be about the electronic warfare threat in this scenario then and what i mean with uh, low probability of detection and especially how uh, these type of communication means vhf and uhf are very vulnerable but if you apply this one in a more correct procedure and use radio silence and stuff like that those kind of procedures and then use hf to a higher command well then you have uh, you have a countermeasure for the electronic warfare component. More on that in the next episode. So until then, I say, as I usually say, then 73, end of message, out.